Hello. Welcome. Um, hello and welcome. I'm uh, Yuritsi Bersi from Reporters United, Greek investigative journalist team. This is Ingeborg Eliasson. She's the coordinator of investigations at Investigate Europe. Reporters United is the Greek partner of Investigate Europe. The reason why we're here today is because seven months ago in this country, a horrible tragedy happened. Two trains traveling against each other collided. And we're here to say that they were traveling in a collision course, not for 12 minutes, but for 13 years at least. And what you, what you will hear next from us are, uh, are a, is a description of our efforts to investigate the circumstances, to investigate how, what led to this crash before it happened, and also afterwards. Trains used to be the past. Now they're supposed to be the future because of the climate crisis. We wanted to find out how European railway systems work to see if they are on track for this green future. Um, so we're back in October 2021. Very first time Evridiki and I worked together. It was a very cute small collaboration which consisted of a plain interview with one man who was a veteran of Swiss railways um, and, and he was former head of it, and he was also very uh, high up in European railway organizations. We did the interview online, uh, remote from Greece and Norway to Switzerland. So Benedict, Benedict Weibel described himself as a practical man. No dogmas except for one. If you split a railway system, you will completely fail. That was very interesting for us to hear because we were hearing the exact opposite. So um, the European Union was busy uh, telling countries to sell off the more profitable parts of the railway, to spin off maintenance, to spin off whatever they could spin off. And that was the spirit of the 90s. The, blow, the state sector is bloated, we need uh, the private sector, the dynamism. Some of you might remember how uh, the thinking back then went. So in the railways, there were four rail, uh, EU railway packages, three pieces of legislation. The point was uh, to introduce competition, to, increase, uh, to impose common standards, and to supposedly connect the railways uh, internationally. So Weibel asked a very simple question. Does all this work? And he said, no, it does not work. Because railway systems should be like clockworks. They must be coordinated. If you fragment them, instead of coordination, what you get is endless conflict. Switzerland had already tried a, a, a fragmented system like 100 years ago, and they were adamant they were not going back there. So they kept everything, the track, the maintenance, the freight, the passenger, under one roof. They sat back and looked at what happened to the rest of us. 2021 was uh, the European year of rail. I don't know if you remember, remember that. Uh, it had, of course, been planned for a long time, but it coincided with a raging pandemic when people were uh, minimally on the move. At the end of the year, the EU Commission nevertheless summed it up as the beginning of a new journey towards a rail renaissance that can help Europe become climate neutral by 2050. For us, it didn't take very long to see that the year of rail was a hollow PR exercise. In some ways, in fact, European railways are worse off now than in the past, due to widespread neglect and losing out to car, bus and airlines lobbies. We also found that EU railway policies had sort of been captured by this ideological belief in privatization, where some basic insights had been left behind at the platform. 
So we set out to find out how that had happened by asking ourselves, who killed the train? Investigate Europe usually does not begin our research with a leak. Uh, we go a longer way. We enter the engine rooms of our societies and systems to understand what makes them tick, or often what does not make them tick. In this case, many of us just also sat a lot because we were trying out long-distance train connections. This way of working, of course, takes a lot of time, and it doesn't immediately produce headlines but it puts us in touch with sources and gives us competences that are not there to get unless we make that investment. And now we will try to show you, with the help of the technical crew, what we found with this project's animation made by Alexia Baraku and Nicolas Leontopoulos from Reporters United here in Greece. Twenty twenty one was dubbed the European Year of Rail as part of the EU's efforts to tackle the climate crisis. To mark the moment, the Commission launched the Connecting Europe Express, a train that would crisscross twenty six countries and showcase the unifying force of rail. Unifying force? During its journey, the Connecting Europe Express had to change locomotives fifty five times. Investigate Europe's team of journalists from 14 countries took a ride on the continent's trains to investigate the state of Europe's railways. Paolo left Lisbon at sunrise and arrived in Madrid at night. He had to board four different trains that took 11 hours to cover 600 kilometers. Nico and Lorenzo approached the Brenner Tunnel. When completed in 2032, it will be the longest railway tunnel in the world. Yet to date, no one knows who, if anyone, will use it. Attila and Anna traveled from Budapest to Belgrade to Piraeus, a trade route snubbed for decades by the EU, yet now promoted and funded by Beijing. What did they uncover? Railways seem to be in a worse state than 20 years ago, despite four European Union rail packages. Many domestic networks have shrunk drastically, while international connections have also suffered a big blow. Night trains have almost disappeared. Cross-border online ticketing is often a bad joke. On both domestic and international routes, more than one in two trains is late. So, who killed the train? Was it the forced separation of railway infrastructure from train operations, a rule that exists only in Europe? Was it the privatization and supposed liberalization of the railways? Or, on the contrary, was it big players like SNCF and Deutsche Bahn who stifled competition through protectionism and double standards? Was it national governments who heavily subsidized aviation, car makers, and motorways while neglecting railways? In this whodunit, they are all culprits, and not the only ones. To find out who else has blood on their hands, read our investigations by media partners across Europe. Yeah. Governments interpret EU directives differently. By 2011, 12 countries in Europe, mostly in the geographical south and north, such as Greece and Norway, had completely separated rail operations and infrastructure. When you think about it, railways are especially unfit for privatization and fragmentation. Precision is the most important feature, and precision requires coordination, and coordination requires someone to have full oversight. So a number of countries had discarded this system. But in the EU core, some governments interpreted the directive more freely. They still had partly integrated railways. On top of that structure, there are state-owned holding companies that have ultimate control and responsibility. And these have remained strong brands. Just think of SNCF in France and Deutsche Bahn in Germany. Where it happened, the splitting up had many unfortunate consequences, not least for passengers. Often higher prices, often less good connections. For staff and maintenance, it had meant cutbacks and split responsibilities, which ultimately put safety at risk for everybody. For the international network that is supposed to be there in Europe, many more vested interests than before 
prevent the necessary coordination and collaboration. We made lots of stories uh, in different countries uh, of the investigation and they were published with media partners in our respective countries, in our respective styles and, and, and languages, and with our specific angles. They had common features, but they also had distinct national characteristics. This, for example, is a story in Spanish about uh, rail passenger rights. I don't know if you've noticed, a rail passenger has a lot fewer rights than an airline passenger. For example, if they miss a connection. The European Union uh, promised to fix this. We followed this, these legislative efforts. Uh, they led nowhere. In some countries, passengers have even fewer rights than the ones guaranteed by the EU, by the way. This is another story in Norway, where the former state company uh, has been fragmented into 20 pieces. It was way beyond what the EU demanded. Uh, it was opposed by unions. It made the railway of Norway, the, no the railway service, more expensive and less coordinated. And please note that now, so that like a couple of years after this story came out, um, the Norwegian government is starting to reverse this policy and reintegrate the railway. That's the Hungarian story by Telex. Uh, it's, uh, Hungary is home to the Budapest Belgrade rail line. It was financed with uh, Chinese loans. Attila Kalman, who's, and, and the Serb, uh, who's uh, the Hungarian colleague, and Anna Kuric, the Serb colleague, they collaborated in Serbia, and they got hold of a document that was secret in Hungary, and it showed that the loan given out to the Hungarian government by the Chinese would take around 1,000 years uh, to pay off. This story went all the way to the Hungarian parliament. But Attila was also brave enough to try and come all the way here from Budapest by train. Do you know how long it took him? It took him four days. <laughs> it's true, because he had to, he had to step off, uh, change, uh, walk on foot, some, some, uh, cross some borders on foot get the bus, it was really, it was really uh, an odyssey. And the last leg of this odyssey, so coming from Thessaloniki to Athens, it looked like an oasis. It looked like, oh, finally, I'm somewhere where the rail uh, functions. And, and this was, for us, the worst part of this research, because then we realized that this was also an illusion that there were very serious problems also in the Athens-Thessaloniki line, which is the core of the Greek railway network. Here's one of those problems. Um, it's, um, it was our story on the supposedly modern trains that uh, the new Italian owners of the Greek railways brought to Greece. Uh, those trains, uh, the Swiss had them and they had sent them to the scrapyard. They actually saved one uh, carriage for the railway museum. So, it's, the story was a Reporters United story printed uh, for, for the front page of uh, FCN newspaper and it pierced the media bubble uh, in a way because Many people at that mo moment realized that most of the things that we knew about the railway, that we were hearing about the railway, were uh, PR communication, press releases by the company or by the ministry. So you see, this is uh, that story uh, in Italian and English from the Investigate Europe website. And um, it says something about the interest among people for trains that the English version of this uh, article was the second most read story ever in the history of Investigate Europe. So there were more articles on, than this one. In Greek, uh, we published a, so there was a series of three articles. Uh, I'll run quickly through the conclusions. Uh, the modernization claims are often misleading. Hellenic train, the Italian company, does not fulfill its obligations for public service. 
and the Troika mandated staff cuts and the subsequent retirements that, ha that have happened ever since the Troika was here, so for the past 13 years, uh, they actually make it impossible to run the Greek railways. Just to give you an idea, before there were 12,500 employees in the one and only Greek railway company, OSE. Now, at the, frag the fragmented um, landscape, so the companies, the companies that came after, they all together employed 2,000 people. So we went from 12,500 people to 2,000 people. Uh, this was not going to end well. Uh, one year later, a uh, disaster struck. That was the frontal collision, freight train, passenger train, near Larissa, uh, 57 people, mostly young people, lost their lives. How did you react when this happened, Evridiki? Uh, I was not as shocked as everybody else because I had already experienced the shock and the horror while I was doing the research. But still, it was very, very tough for everybody. So I guess all journalists uh, went into action at that point. So what advantages did you have uh, from your previous work? Uh, I mean, what did you know that many others didn't, do you think? Yeah, first of all, let's point out here that it wasn't just us at Reporters United that did, uh, that had investigated the Greek railways before. Other investigative teams have, have tried as well. Um, so when it comes to me, uh, I wasted zero time following the TV coverage. So everybody was stuck in front of the, t of, of the TV screens and they just didn't. Uh, I refused and uh, I just went to work immediately. I sort of started um, the research from where I would finished, where I would left it uh, a, year, a year back. And, and suddenly documents that were unavailable uh, had reached a wall in, in the past. Suddenly doors opened and documents came. And we, there, was, there was a frantic rush to actually say a story that was different than what was being said. So there was a very strong attempt by the government to put the entire blame for this accident on the shoulders of the station master of Larissa. And what we did was to look at the business side of the story. Okay, so you show us the stories you were able to make. Yes, that's, this was the story that uh, we made uh, a week after a huge collective effort by uh, the whole Reporters United team to do it uh, that quickly. and. Uh, it was a story about the mismanagement and the tragic delays in the modernization works of the Athens Thessaloniki line. Uh, works that, if they had been completed, the accident would have been impossible to happen. We named the companies responsible, the Greek actor and the French Alstom, and uh, we published documents that showed that instead of being punished for not doing what they promised to, uh, they were rewarded with more time and more money. By the way, the European prosecutor was already, we didn't know that at the time, the European prosecutor was already on the case because there was EU money involved, EU funds were, uh, were given in order to, to complete these, these works. And a few months later, in July, 26 people from those two companies and from Ergose, which is uh, the state company responsible for railway projects, uh, were named as suspects in a case that is ongoing. So we published your story in many countries. And um, we think it uh, shows that slow journalism can be the fastest sometimes in the longer run. If you invest journalists' time in digging into a particular field, it will inevitably yield interesting stories. And if something dramatic happens, it may be those people who are able to understand quickly where to ask and what to ask. This is really very obvious. Um, 
when I started as a journalist, which is ages ago, uh, and before a series of technological and financial shocks in the industry, there was hardly a domain of public life that was not the specialty of some journalist. And since then, society has gotten more complex and difficult to understand every day. While this is happening, most newsrooms have abolished specialized staff, which is, of course, the opposite of what is needed if journalism is to be watchdogs in our systems. It means that big sectors of our systems that used to be scrutinized have become journalistic blind zones or deserts. This leaves opportunity for neglect and misuse of power and taxpayers' money. Very often, we journalists feel now that we are running in hamster wheels. We have little time to prepare, so sources and official communication people have an enormous edge on us. This makes us vulnerable to all kinds of man manipulation. So investigative, but really simply thorough journalism is now often seen as a luxury branch that most media cannot afford. And it is true that it takes time to understand issues to the core and to build a network of sources and to have them trust and respect you by publishing things that they see credible. But when that investment is done, it very often is a gift that keeps on giving, such as in the case of the Greek railways, right? Because there were more stories. Yeah, unfortunately. So this was a story uh, about faulty concrete slabs uh, that are cracking by the thousands, risking a derailment if they are not be replaced. Uh, we ran this story in July. Nobody spoke about this problem. They knew it for years, and it, was, it, it keeps getting worse. Nobody spoke about it because it's in a part of the track that is ultra new, so it's not supposed to, to be happening. And because the company responsible is Terna, which is very well connected politically. And so we broke the story. Um, the impact was that uh, the, they recognized the final, finally there was a public acknowledgement of the problem and they, uh, the, the railway company imposed um, delay, no, uh, impo made trains go slower in the problematic uh, parts of the track, which um, is a step, the first step, we are still waiting, of course, for uh, the works to replace those problematic uh, concrete slabs, but unfortunately, this will not be a problem in the foreseeable future because as many of you know, we have no trains at the moment in Greece. What, what happened? This, this happened. Uh, there was a, a mega flood uh, in early September. It damaged 50 kilometers of train in the main railway axis and more than 100 kilometers in the secondary network. This, this is where we are. We, we just have no trains running. Uh, now I'd like to uh, get you back to, to the, main, the main conclusion that we drew from all this research, both in, in uh, Greece and in Europe, and that is that neglect in the railway system uh, is systemic. It's not accidental. It didn't just happen in one country or in one certain period. It is there to stay. The car, the bus, the airplane, the construction lobbies are really all in favor of more car travel. That's, that's a fact that we really need to keep in mind when we interpret what's happening. And a, a good development is that after the February crash, many colleagues here in Greece started doing a lot more reporting on the railways. They always wanted to do, to do it, but there was minimal interest, and now suddenly they found the space to do it. So now we have, um, we're, we're much, much more 
sensitive to what's happening in the railway system. And believe me, we will need all this interest because we need to take a very, very close look at the government response to what happened to the major disaster that happened now. Because if we don't, if we just believe that they will just fix it, we know what will happen. They won't. They w it will take forever. Many companies will become rich and the works that w will not be completed. We will, maybe they'll lose something for the freight trains because the freight trains um, are, they, are, they have contracts and they really, there's really pressure to do something. But passenger trains, we risk forgetting that we even had a passenger rail connection. So uh, for the sake of the climate and for many other reasons, we must not allow this to happen. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So we are slow journalists, so we spent almost all our time on speaking ourselves. We were supposed to have questions, but there is very little time left, so I don't know what... Uh, there is. We, we still have three, four minutes, so if there's a question, we're happy to answer. Thank you. It was a, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I want to ask, so journalists will play the role of watchdog. They will do the reporting even before or after an accident. You give us the data. Um, we, ha we know, we have the knowledge that uh, things are wrong. Who has the authority now to fix them? And what journalists can do to uh, enforce um, the protection of people since stuff like that have been uh, unveiled? Thank you. Should we answer or should we get a second question? Okay, no, let's, let's, uh, let, me, let me try to, to, to answer this. So the responsibilities are fragmented, as I said, and this, is, this makes things trickier than in the past. Uh, but there's always something you can do to find out who's responsible. And uh, sometimes, for example, in this case, many, of, of the, uh, many parts of the damaged tracks uh, are insured, so it's the insurance companies that will uh, need to foot the bill. So there's, there is, um, there's ways. There's no, it's not like you, you are in the dark and you know nothing. It's just what needs to be done is to follow the story and ask the right questions. That's the short answer. Do you want to say something? Okay. Do we? There are many hands now. Mm -hmm. Hi, and congratulations for your work. I would like to ask if this, uh, after the Tempe accident, uh, if uh, this work had uh, impact on your media organizations, if, you, if your work was acknowledged, if you had more supporters, uh, if uh, you had interest for more investigations that would be funded, stuff like that. I'd say uh, it's hard. Very often we... Uh, it's systemic what we do, you know, we, we, we look at systems. It's not really governments have to leave a type of stories very often. Um, what we hope is that uh, we tell people what is going on to make it something, it's understandable. And in this case, we saw a lot of reading of the stories, meaning people are really, people are ready to take the train if it would only go if there was only a service that would be cheap enough and uh, connected enough to be, you know, predictable. Uh, I don't think we can boast that we, we had any major... Well, actually, uh, at Reporters instant United, impact. 
Our reporters united. There was, uh, there was very, very moving messages that we got from readers that made us want to continue, and they appreciated very much. And they, yes, we, there, there was an impact in, 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 in the funding because we are crowdfunded, as maybe some of you know. So, yes, I, we, did, we did see an impact. That's, that's the short answer. I was speaking ap apart from Greece, so of course Greece was an exception this time. Uh, we are out of time. I see this yes, yes. time flashing. So, but please feel free, feel free to find us uh, afterwards. Okay. Uh, as I saw in the slides, so I'm calling the kind of surprised that by the uh, Western media, it has presented the, the, as a source of uh, economic uh, historic uh, conscience. Uh, maybe my card, uh, when it's happened, uh, maybe as it happened, uh, originally it presented as the current government's fault, despite that it's been for a long of time, besides the crisis. It, okay, Okay, so it's not even a new thing, and it's happened for years. It has uh, this, this accident that has happened in Tebbe. It has started the fire and the coffin. Okay, wherever it was, it's viewed in then, because no one cared about it. No one talked it. it when, when we start caring about talking about the problems in the very well, well, it, it was too late. Thank you. And it's true, this, uh, this um, neglect thing, I mean, it's not one person's responsibility. It's, it's many people who share that uh, responsibility because it's small things. Okay, we can cut this person's job because we can overlap with somebody else's. So, yeah, so this is a big, uh, difficult thing to pinpoint, but uh, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.